I'm Nigel Mbayek, one of the customer success managers and your host for today's and just about every other day's AVAs. And today I'm joined by Justin Cow. Justin, how's it going? Good, Nigel. So Justin's one of the application engineers here on the team, works primarily on the automation team. And so if maybe you were working on one of the one of the, on a, one of the automation projects with our team, uh, more than likely you've worked with someone like Justin or one of his counterparts on the team, which makes Justin perfect for today's session, which is all about configuration modeling using iLogic, right? Which is something that Justin and the rest of his team uh, do on a daily basis there. It looks like Justin's on a game show this morning. Um, maybe he's going to configure the, uh, the set for one well, of the games. If, if the price is right. Absolutely. Um, so if anyone has any questions, go ahead and type them in. Uh, and we'll go ahead and answer those for you either here in the background or during the dedicated Q and A at the end. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to my good friend, Justin, uh, and he will take it away. You're all in good hands. We'll see you at the end. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. All right, everyone. Um, cool. So today we're going to be talking about configuration modeling using iLogic within an assembly. A couple months back, I did the AVA on doing iLogic with configuration modeling in a part. And by popular demand on that one, everyone was asking, how do I do it within an assembly? I got reached out by people at Autodesk. They're like, oh, are you guys gonna show stuff on assembly? So that's what we're gonna do today for you guys. Cool. So let's do a quick introduction. So a little bit of background about myself. Like Nigel said, I am an application engineer here at Kativ. I work on the automation team. So I do a lot of automation code. So within Inventor API, I also do content creation within Inventor, Vault, AutoCAD, you name it, I do it here. And I also um, do some, like I just said, I do automation here. So I do Inventor API for you guys. So stuff in Visual Studios, do the coding behind that. If you guys have a project on it here with the Kativ, I most likely touch it. And a little bit background about myself. I am a Cal Poly Pomona alumni, graduated with a mechanical engineer background. So a little overview about what we're gonna be talking today. So if you guys don't know what configuration modeling is, I highly suggest you guys go back to our Kativ AVA back in March, I believe. We did one on parts and it's going to be very similar to that, except instead of doing it at a part level, we're gonna bring it to an assembly level. So like it says, configuration modeling in an assembly is when multiple parts um, you put into an assembly and you can configure them, whether it's length, width, height, or you could take some things out, take, put some stuff in. And the main goal here is that you want your assemblies to be somewhat similar. You don't wanna change from one thing to another. So example, if you're making a box, you don't wanna change from a box and start making fish tanks, for example, something obscurely wild. So within this master assembly itself, you want it to control all the parameters in there. So any configuration that you have, and this way it can consolidate all the assemblies into one making organization a little bit easier for you guys. So pros of configuration modeling, like I said, concise organized organization of files. So you don't have to go run around and search for multiple assemblies. If you guys have multiple assemblies that look pretty much similar to one another, you could use the inventor API. So stuff like Visual Studio, you could use to program that so things can get built easier. And it also is an, a nice, easy way to jump into iLogic if you guys haven't touched on that yet. So next thing, how to determine what models are good for configuration modeling and what aren't good for it. So like I said earlier, you, you want things that are very similar in, um, the way they, in the way they look, in the way they move. So for example, we have here a box and you know the box is constrained to a length, width, and a height. So you don't really want to go from this to a cylinder where a cylinder is just height and radius. Even though they share that height parameter in common, you don't really want to jump from one thing to another. And that's mainly within a part, but in an assembly, just say you have openings that are square and circle, that's perfectly fine. So we'll go ahead and go more into detail about that. And if you guys have any questions on that, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll answer that for you guys. So right here, things that iLogic could do for configuration modeling within an assembly and at a part, you can set parameter values so you can drive 
any parameters that you want, anything you want pushed, if you want dimension changed, you can suppress and unsuppress features. So if you want things to show up and not show up, you can do that. And you can also set eye properties. Cool, so that's my presentation for right now. Um, any questions as of right now? You look good to move straight into the demo, Justin. Perfect, thank you. So let's go ahead and open up Inventor. So today we are going to be the Kati Furniture Store. So I modeled a bunch of furnitures for you guys and let's see how things work. So within this model right here, I have simple bookshelf right here. And if we go over up to my parameters on the top, I have stuff that control the legs, the, the width of the legs, the height of this bookshelf, the width of the bookshelf, and then the height of both of these shelves. So here I can start changing things. Like for example, if I want the, uh, my width to be a little bit bigger, I can push 40 inches here and this and then grow to 40 inches. And then in my iLogic, I have a configuration rule. If I right click on that and edit the rule, pretty much here I have stuff that is driving the height of the shelves itself. So between this, this shelf and that shelf right here. And also I have it so at a certain, if the bookshelf is over 60 inches here, then we're only going to have one shelf. If the shelf is less than, wait, if it's more than 60 inches, you're gonna have two shelves. If it's less than 60 inches, you can only have one shelf. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate that for you guys right now. So it was driven off of bookshelf height. So right now we're at 70 inches. So you're gonna have two shelves. But if I put something like 59, you're gonna see that it combines and it only makes one shelf right there. For this demo, we're gonna go ahead and put it back to 70. Cool, let's go ahead and jump over to our next model. So here we have a simple dresser. This one, we have some iLogic in it as well. So this one, we have stuff with drawer orientation, whether the drawers are going to be vertical or horizontal. So right here, I have a simple code right here that compresses, um, that suppresses and unsuppresses the drawer configuration. So if I go right here, go to the parameters, and let's say we want vertical doors, that's what we have right here. If we want horizontal doors, you're gonna see that we have three drawers right here. And then we can drive how many drawers we have. So we want four, go ahead and push four drawers right there. Want two, go ahead and do two drawers. And this one's also the same where we can change the length, the width and the height of this drawer. Cool. Our next model, just a simple TV. You're gonna see this one has no eye logic within it. And on top of that, there is no parameters. Always a fixed 50 inch screen TV right here. So let's go ahead and jump over into our assembly. So right here, I have things constrained. So I have two shelves and I have a drawer right here. And then we have the TV on top. No funny business here, it's just simple, clean right here. So let's go ahead and jump into our parameters. So you're going to see I have stuff like height, configuration, dresser height, bookshelf height, drawers, drawer orientation, depth, and package. Some of these parameters might look similar to the two parts that we have between bookshelf and drawers. Like you see dresser height and bookshelf height, drawers and drawer orientation. Those are pretty much the same exact parameter names that we have over here in these parts down here. So the biggest thing that you have to do at the very beginning, if you want configuration modeling in the assembly level, you're going to want to link the parameters between the part and the assembly so things are getting pushed over correctly. So let's go ahead and start and we're gonna run through that right now. So if we go over to iLogic, I have a rule right here and it's called parameters. And the sole purpose of this rule is to only push parameters from the part to the assembly so the assembly knows exactly what it needs to do. So at the very top right here, so we name this parameter from bookshelf one and we wanna make sure that bookshelf height gets pushed the parameter in the assembly right here and the assembly parameter is called bookshelf height. So a cool way to get this function is right here on the left, you're gonna see under parameters, 
you have all these options for iLogic functions and functionalities. So right here, parameter assemblies, if you go ahead and double click that, it has a default um, template for you right here. So you can insert whatever your part is, the name of your parameter, and what your parameter is or what you want it to be. So let me go ahead and delete that because we're not gonna be using that. So right here I have linked dresser part one. So right here in the model tree. So I have dresser height linked to dresser height in the parameter. I have drawers linked to drawers in this parameter set right here. And then drawer orientation. So that's the one where it goes vertical or horizontal. And then for the bookshelf, I have bookshelf depth and then dresser depth. So and then here you're gonna see right here for the, between the bookshelf and the dresser, even though they have two separate parameters in the two parts, I'm going to be linking them with one parameter right here in the assembly. So regardless of what the bookshelf depth, whatever the bookshelf depth is and the dresser depth is at the part, they're gonna be overridden with this parameter right here in the assembly. Cool. So now we're gonna go ahead and run over to our configuration. So if I go ahead and edit the rule here, and this is pretty much very similar to what we did in the other AVA, things with, with suppress and unsuppressing features, and then at the same time setting dimensions to make sure that your configurations are right. So right here we have a select case for configuration. Let me go ahead and pull up the parameter list first. So under configuration right here, we have two configuration. We have one for our bedroom, and then we have one for an entertainment system. So for your TV, your speakers, etc. Jumping back to the configuration, you're going to see I have a select case. So for the case of the bedroom, I want the dresser height to always equal the height of the bookshelf. And then right here, I also want, um, if this is going to be a bedroom set, I don't want to have a TV on the bedroom set. So I'm gonna make sure that that, um, that occurrence of that model is false, which means it's going to be suppressed. And for an entertainment system, let's say I always want the dresser height to be 36 inches, and then the bookshelf height to always be 70 inches. And I wanna make sure on the entertainment, the TV shows up. You can go ahead and ignore this right here, extra stuff. And down here we have package. We can have a deluxe package, so we're gonna have more stuff on it. And in a basic package, we're gonna have less models in it. So here, if you have a deluxe package, you're going to see that you have both the bookshelves and the dresser. But if you have a basic package, you're only going to have the dresser, no bookshelves on it. Cool, so let's gonna go ahead and save and run it. And then one thing we always do at an assembly level or a part level, regardless of what, what it is, we wanna make sure if you have multiple iLogic rules running, we always wanna have a build rule. And the reason why we want to have this build rule is that it's going to control that hey, we're gonna make sure that the parameter iLogic is running, and then we're gonna make sure the configuration iLogic is always running at the same time. So that way we don't have to worry about, have to run each rule individually, and then you have to run it in a certain order. So go ahead, I'll show you this rule right here. Super simple script right here. And what we do is we make sure that iLogic vb.run rule configuration. So we're gonna run the configuration rule first, and then we're gonna run the parameter rule second. And it does matter which order you do it in. So I'll go ahead and show you after this example right here. So, and then right here, iLogic update when done. So it's always gonna run after you press run. Cool, so let's go ahead and start switching some parameters around up here. So right now we want to have a bedroom set and we want the drawers, let's say we want them to be horizontal and we'll keep it as deluxe package right now. So right here, you're gonna see, we saw the TV and for our bedroom package, we, want, we don't want the TV in there. So if I go ahead and right click on the build rule and run it, you're going to see that right here, the level of detail, really important for us right here. So if you're in the master level of detail, right here, as we are right here, it will not let you suppress and unsuppress stuff compared to a part at a part, you can suppress and unsuppress stuff without being in the master level. So let me go ahead and show you that. So on this bookshelf right here, 
remember when we were doing the overall height of the bookshelf, we were saying if this was like 59 inches, you're going to see that the shelf is suppressed. And you're gonna see the feature suppressed right here on the right. So let's see, we're in the master view right now. And this one, you can't have level of details at a part, so you don't have to worry about it. But in an assembly, it does matter. So what we've done is we are gonna right click, create a new level of detail. So right here, right here we have level of detail two, and I'm just going to name it level of detail. And then we're gonna name something like configurations. So we know that this level of detail is gonna handle all the suppressed and unsuppressed of things that we have. So now that we're in this level of detail, let's go ahead and go back, run our rule. And you're going to see that the height automatically updated to make sure that it's the same as the dresser height. So now in here, if we go ahead and change that dresser height, just say we want it to be 80 inches, you're gonna see nothing happens. You have to go back to your build rule and make sure you run it. And you're going to see if I start measuring it, If I measure it, let's see. So we're having an issue right here where I, I logic it didn't update this parameter. So now that it's 80, let's go ahead and build it and see what happens here. See, you're gonna see that it updated to 80 inches for both of them. So now let's go ahead and switch it back to the TV and see what it does. So we have the entertainment system. Go ahead and do that, run it, run rule. And you're going to see it, how it updates automatically for you once you build it. So let's go back into this build rule. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean when these matters, um, the order in which you run these rule matter. So let's go ahead and put this parameter rule at the very top. So we have something like that. We're gonna go ahead and save it. So now let's go ahead and mess with this package between deluxe and basic. So if I do basic, you run it, it's gonna work. So now let's go back to deluxe and then also a bedroom set. If I run the rule, it's running. So right now, since we have everything running, it's not um, showing up in, with any problems. Usually what happens if you don't have this build rule in the right order, you have to make sure you run your configuration first before you run your parameter push because what, what it's doing here is in the configuration, you're setting all your variables at the assembly level to make sure that you have things in the right position, you want things that are there, make sure that all your parameters are set correctly. If you run your parameter rule first, the parameters only care about it at a part level. It doesn't care what you're setting at the assembly level. So if you run your configuration first, it sets the assembly level parameters and then it pushes it down to the part. And that's the correct order you want things to run. Sometimes it'll take two builds with the build rule. So I've had issues where you had to run this rule twice in order for it to update correctly compared to only running it once. So it's just an extra step in the way you're gonna have an issue where you might see that things aren't working correctly. So make sure that your parameter rules are always in the right order. Cool. Is there any questions right now, Nigel? Uh, there's a couple, we'll just, we'll just chug on, we'll take those at the end, no worries. All right, perfect. Cool, so you're gonna see, like what I, what I was saying, if you're in the wrong level of detail, so if I go back to master, it's going to um, have some issues. You're going to see that if I start running the rules for, let's see, the bedroom one, like for example, you're gonna have this error right here. It's gonna say, hey, your level of detail is not the right level of detail. So you're gonna to wanna to make a custom level of detail. And then, so to note, if you're having to do configuration model and assembly, in your master level of detail, you're going to place everything in here. So if you have things that are overlapping each other, don't worry about it, don't stress out yet. Once you get into your custom level of detail, things are going to line up correctly for you. So for example, let's just say I wanted to place another 
bookshelf in the middle right here. Just say something like that, for example. And then things are gonna line up incorrectly. But if we fix it, if we switch it over to our level of detail configurations, we can start doing some quick eye logic. So in my configuration, I wanna make sure that that bookshelf three is going to be suppressed in the basic package, for example. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click, capture that statement, and just make sure we set this to false. Save. So we're gonna run it. Oh shoot, I made a simple mistake right there. Whenever you do it in select cases, you have to make sure you put it in both cases because it doesn't understand if you don't have it in both cases. It, it will show that it's always there or it might never show that it's there. So let's go ahead and we're gonna make it false for both. So now if we run it, you're gonna see that it disappears. So don't be too worried in your level of detail if things start doubling up on you. So in the master. So things might end up like this. Things might end up a little bit nicer. So don't stress about that until the very end. And then you can start playing around with that to make sure that all your parameters are driven correctly. Cool, so besides that, I think it kind of wraps up what we have for today. So let's go ahead. Oh, if you have your build rule, make sure that you suppress your other two rules that you're not, you don't want it running always at the same time. So Usually they're always unsuppressed, but since this build rule is handling both of those rules running, make sure that you're always suppressing those or else things are gonna get kind of wacky for you and things are gonna update automatically when you don't want things to update. Cool, so besides that, I think that kind of wrapped it up. Let's go ahead and start getting some questions out of the way. Yeah, no worries, Justin. So let's let's go ahead and start answering some of these questions that came through. Um, if you wanna open up your original um, parameter links rule, I think this yes. one has to do with that question. So this first right question is, yep, first question is, uh, what are the advantages or disadvantages um, to using the linking tools within the parameters window or linking the rules within iLogic um, like you have in this rule right here? So right, what we're doing right now is we're linking things in iLogic. Um, the reason why I like doing it like this is there's no, there's no hiccups. You know exactly what you're getting when you do it. You know for sure that, hey, this bookshelf height is always gonna equal this bookshelf height. But when you link stuff in this parameter list, it doesn't really work that well. You have, um, you might misclick something and then you have to go back and fix everything. It's just a lot of going back and forth. Um, if you do it within, here, you know exactly what you're gonna do. You know exactly where it is. And you can always just go back and edit it. So for yeah, example, can... he, oh, go ahead, Nigel. Go ahead, Justin. Oh, what I was gonna say is like, just in case right here, you say you want bookshelf height as bookshelf height. But in the case that you actually just want it as height, we can just uncomment these two codes up here and then comment down out here and then makes it a lot, lot, lot easier. Yeah, it's a lot easier to manage multiple part linkages this way as opposed to having them all within the parameters window itself, um, especially if you want to edit it, play around with some things. Um, there's just a lot more flexibility doing things um, this way than there are in, you know, just using the regular parameters window. Exactly. And another thing to note, there are multiple ways to do it in iLogic. You can write a whole script that once you have your parameters in your part, you can start putting the parameters in your assembly and things start linking over automatically as long as they have the same name. That's another method. We're not gonna get in that today, but yeah, there's multiple ways to do it. There's not a single right way. There's not a single wrong way. The way you were saying about linking it, definitely 100% you could do that. But this way is just the easier way to manage it. You see everything at one place and there's no guessing what you have and what you don't have. Yeah, just an easier way to see everything too, I think. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not necessarily like seeing the actual values for the parameters. You're still gonna use the parameters window to do that. Um, yep. To be able to manage the, the parameters, especially once you start getting into assemblies that are like not five parts, you get, excuse yep. me, 
there's some blades that are like 50 parts. Um, it's way easier to manage them if they're all, it's like, you know, doing things in a spreadsheet versus, you know, your calculator, I guess. Uh, you can manage it all. Exactly. Um, that way. Um, so let's jump to the next question then. So Brad asks, how do you deal with a rule that's inside parts, um, which are loaded when, when, and would it be best to have your rules only in your assembly level? Cool. Good question. That's what I have here. So let's go ahead and not save this rule. You're going to see I have rules in this um, bookshelf, for example. I have a configuration right here. Make sure that the drawers, if there's only one drawer or not, or there's two, not drawers, shelves. If there's one shelf or two shelves. So based on the height. So if I go ahead and go back to here, we're going to see that since the height is tall enough, so it's over 60 inches, you're going to have two shelves. But if I go over here, and then switch the bookshelf height to be 59 inches like we used before. You're not going to see anything happen. You have to run your build rule. You got to make sure you're in the right level of detail again. Go ahead and build it again. It is not setting the variables correctly. Oh, so the reason why it's not setting correct there, I realize I hard dimensioned it in here. So the bookshelf height is 70. Let's go ahead and make it 59. Save, close, let's run the rule. And you're going to see that it automatically updates it. So for stuff like where you're going to have a multi-value parameter, I like to keep the naming exactly the same so that way you know exactly what you're looking at. So in the bookshelf, what's driving that is, let's see, bookshelf, bookshelf, bookshelf height. height. Yeah, yeah, the bookshelf height. So I wanna make sure that that bookshelf height is always pushed the right value. So I hear I have it as bookshelf height. So make sure that, hey, if it's 59 inches, it's going to only show up as one shelf. And it does pick up the rule. So you don't have to worry about, hey, do I have to link iLogic rules between a part and assembly or vice versa? It automatically picks it up as you have it, right? Yep, and it's picking up because the parameters are linked, so. Like, yep, exactly. If the parameters weren't linked, right, it wouldn't be running the rule in the part level, so. Yeah, so uh, if I had, since we know that bookshelf height is driving that, if I put bookshelf depth, it's not gonna pick up that, um, that value, for example. Yep, yeah, so it's just a thing where you just have to make sure that, you know, double check sanity, right, and make sure that all the names are the same, You've got, uh, you know, you've got underscores when, where you have underscores, spaces where you have spaces. I don't suggest using spaces at all in here. Yeah, um, never use spaces. I think it doesn't even allow you to use spaces. It shouldn't, yeah. Not for um, parameters, at least. Yep, absolutely, yeah. So just make sure that you have all of the syntax correctly. Um, generally, when people are like, hey, my logic rule is not running, right? Just, like, honestly, go to your neighbor and ask them for a second set of eyes on it and be like, can you find any typos? And more likely than not, um, they'll find something because I think it's just really common as like, for example, Justin is someone who's in here all day doing stuff like this. Um, it all starts to blur together. And then yeah. the second you get another set of eyes on it, it's like within five seconds, you're like, dude, there's a typo right here. Yeah. You're just banging your head against the wall for an hour. Um, but it took someone five minutes to figure out your problem. So <laughs> yeah, for me, yeah, for me, I always forget whenever I'm running multiple iLogic rules, I always update the parameters and then I see things haven't changed. And I go crazy and I forget that I always have to run this rule. It's because that's the only way it only runs on the second you run it because it's not updating automatically within here until this rule runs. Yep. So stuff absolutely. like that, you have to make sure like, it's pretty much a, you have to make it a habit of, it's a procedure that you have to follow every time whenever you do this. Yep. And you can get like even more fancy and start adding like buttons to do all of this stuff in ribbons and get yep. real crazy with uh with some of the VB editor stuff to add some things to the inventor interface. So um, that's one thing. Uh, you got a question here from uh, Mr. Josie. Uh, Mr. Do Josie. you recommend setting up eye triggers? I do not. The reason why I, I feel like as long as you have a procedure here set up, it's much easier to just follow the steps like, hey, update parameters. After you update parameters, run rule. So that way you just don't have a, you can program a button, go ahead and say, hey, run rule every time on the second you update a parameter. But if you follow these steps, it's 
I think it's much easier. Two steps, update parameters, run your build rule, you're good to go. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I, I've had some difficulties with some of the triggers in the past, mm -hmm. um, just being unreliable. So uh, if you're having issues with that, simplify it, see if it works. And if it does, then maybe something going wonky in the back end, maybe we can look at it for you um, and figure out what's going on. But in my experience, yeah, as long as you have your procedure down um, in this said, in this fashion, right, it, it could work. Um, and kind of an extension to that question, Mike asks, what about creating a form to run the configuration? That's absolutely, you can do that as well, right? We've done, uh, yep. essentially that's like the next step from this, right? Is instead of editing the parameters within the parameters window, right? If you open a templated assembly, for example, have that fire a form, you add all of the configuration uh, parameters in there, right? Whether they be multi-value or yep. true false or whatever, um, and then run that form and then the run, the form will run the build. Um, exactly. We do that a lot actually with, um, we link our um, customer's Excel sheet to their uh, assembly and then whatever parameters are in the Excel sheet, it pushes it and it reads the whole entire row of, of um, parameters that wants to get pushed and it builds it out for them. Very, very common way to do things when we have like 40, 50 parameters and it's click of a button. Absolutely. And that gets, that gets a lot behind more it. inventor. Yep. Yeah. It figures out all the math, solves all the math. As long as everything is driven correctly, you don't have to worry about it. And yep. then we and do that a lot for an inventor API. Yep. And it makes a lot of sense too if you've already documented your your parts, right? Say for example, you build valves and your valves are they all function correctly, they're all built the same. They're just sized differently. Um, and maybe they're colored differently or whatever, right? There's different parameters around these valves, but they're all essentially the same thing, right? They may all be key valves or whatever. Um, if you have an Excel spreadsheet with all of the values for every single valve you make, you can connect it within here. And then if you select a couple of key parameters, right, that determine, that'll help the software determine which valve to build, it'll go through the whole spreadsheet, build everything with all of those parameters. Um, and so some, some of our customers have like, hey, this is their physical catalog. It's got a spreadsheet at the bottom on their physical catalog with all the sizes and all the dimensions, right? So that they can give it to their customers. Um, so they could be potentially used as vendors for these parts. And uh, if you have that documented already, it's super easy to bring it in here. I, mean, I wouldn't yep. say super easy. Um, yep. It's a lot easier to bring it in here if you already have all of that logic built out in an Excel spreadsheet. Exactly. Makes, makes life a lot easier. Way better than doing like this configuration modeling stuff where I'm doing like, you would rather have everything in an Excel sheet then build like 200 plus configurations. Yeah. I, in this you case could do that two. with it. Yeah. Two, not a big deal. Much easier than going through the hassle of putting all the parameters in Excel, linking the Excel sheet and getting the Excel sheet to build it. But if you have numerous amounts of configurations, Excel sheet, hundred percent way to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as um, long as it's all driven off the same parameters, you don't want things like, Hey, in, in one valve, you have 50 parameters, and in one valve, I only care about one parameter. Stuff like that. You want things to be relatively the same, and then things to relatively look the same. Yeah, just change in size. Yep. Um, mostly, or like in appearance, I guess, right? If you want to use yes. the material and stuff, you can set that in here as well. Yep, 100%. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense. Uh, with that, I think that's all we had for questions. I'll, I'll let everyone, you know, get another 30 seconds or so to ask, ask any questions you do have. Um, I know that automation has been a really hot topic for people um, here at Kativ, as well as a lot of our customers over the last couple of years, uh, just the ease of being able to do this and knowing that it's possible and then seeing the time savings on the back end, whether that be in manpower or, um, or it just gives your, your team the ability to innovate more, right? As opposed to just like rebuild the same things over and over again, maybe work on new projects. Um, it's, been really useful for a lot of our customers. And if it's something you want to explore, definitely let us know. Uh, our team is more than happy to talk to you about what your aspirations are in terms of automation and start building a plan to get there. Uh, some people want to automate 100% of their assembly, right? And that's going to take some time to do. So you want to be able to build a plan to start automating, you know, these more reasonable chunks first with the intention of eventually taking it all the way to the end. And that's the really cool thing about automation is you can automate 5%, you can automate 100%, well, almost mm -hmm. 100%, depending on what you're building. Yeah, the more predictable your assemblies are going to be, the more highly of a chance that we're going to be able to do 
more of that automation for you guys. Yep. And that, like, that's the key thing, predictability. If it's not predictable, chances are that it's going to be a little bit too hard to automate, but it's not impossible. Absolutely. And then we got one more question, right? And so this question is, do you recommend creating custom forms in Visual Studio? If so, are there any plans for a webinar on this topic? Um, and so that's something that's been brought up before. Uh, a good way to say this, Nigel, if you guys want to see that done, fill out the survey at the end and we'll make it happen. Yeah, that's absolutely. Um, and so it is possible uh, to do a lot of what Justin did. I think pretty much all of what Justin did within Visual Studio. Um, and there's reasons to use Visual Studio versus writing the syntax in iLogic. Um, we've mm -hmm. gone over that a couple of times as well. And so if you have any questions about moving that, doing that for your particular project, let us know. And we can help you determine whether or not, you know, you want to just jump into iLogic, use some of the snippets that already exist here, or if you need to get super, super complicated um, or more complicated, not super complicated, just more complicated, start using Visual Studio for it. Yes. And then are the integrations for Google Sheets or other spreadsheet formats for driving automation? Yeah, so you, you integrate your Excel spreadsheet, right? Yeah, Excel. as long as you have, I think, a, a .xlsx file, whether it's yeah. Excel itself or Sheets, you can, you can definitely put it in there. Not a big deal at all. Yep. As long, you need, all you need is really a program that, um, that Inventor can um, communicate with to understand what's happening. Absolutely. Yeah, and then Will's saying, I find dialog boxes in iLogic super limiting as you can only affect I properties. What are your thoughts about providing iLogic forms compiled to DLLs? Um, just use the VP editor instead. Yeah, I, I think we had a project that we had to do stuff with iLogic forms and compile to DLL. It's a, it's a big nightmare. I really suggest not doing that. Yeah, just uh, use the VB editor. It's yeah, VB editor is the best way to go. Yeah, it's super flexible. Cool. Again, Justin, thanks again for the time today. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Hopefully we helped kind of demystify some of this for some people and then help reinforce some of the workflows that some of you have already started using um, within iLogic and doing some configuration modeling. So really appreciate that, um, Justin, as well. And uh, shout out to all of the people that are on here because, uh, you know, it's your presence that makes us keep doing this every week. So definitely appreciate the community. We'll see you all soon. Justin, thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe out there. Absolutely. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.